started in 1959, and uh, it was started by Charles Fish, who was the founder of the Narragansett Laboratory. He was interested in the seasonal patterns of fish abundance in the bay, so that's why it started being a weekly survey. He really wanted to understand the weekly patterns of you know, fish that migrated here and spent the summer and migrated away. He wanted to find out you know, when the bay was being used seasonally by different fish species. It is one of the longest continuous uh, fish surveys in the world. There may be some dispute about you know, which was the very first, but it's uh, certainly one of the longest. And uh, a real advantage is we've been going to the same stations, collecting the same data, week in, week out for 50 years. We measure the temperature, the salinity, and we also measure the oxygen content. And uh, the main thing is we collect data on abundance, that's really the core of it. The biggest result is this paper that we published in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. And that was the first time since Perry Jeffries you know, retired that we'd really looked at the data to see what the long-term trends were. Perry had had some ideas about species replacements, but having a looking at, I think it was 46 years at that time, some of these trends really jumped out at us. In the first two decades, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the catch was dominated by a lot of bottom fish, like the flounders, the hakes, those bottom fish, really, that was the bulk of the, the fish. Starting in the 1970s, 80s, we started to get more invertebrates, more crabs, lobsters, invertebrates that live on the bottom. So we saw a shift, one shift from the sort of fish to the invertebrates. And then the second big change we saw starting in the 80s was we saw a shift from animals that live on the bottom to animals that live in the water column. So more squid, butterfish, scup, so species that are more uh, water column or pelagic feeders. And that's been a really abrupt sort of shift. I certainly thought that the, the effect of, it was the fishing effect that was dominant. We, you know, we fished out those bottom feeding fish and something else came in to replace them. And certainly that's part of the story. But I think since maybe the year 2000, the climatic influence has just been really dominant, that the community structure is shifting in ways that are consistent with global warming, you know, climate change and warming of our, of our waters. We see the, the, uh, the waters have warmed, we have strong evidence of that, and we see the species composition shifting from cold water species to warm water tolerant species. And so the blue crab is a perfect example of that in that in the early days, blue crabs were relatively rare, and now we're catching them you know, commonly, and they're becoming just a regular part of the catch. And we see that as, as the fauna kind of shifting up the coast, where once you know, we were dominated by lobsters, maybe now we're going to have blue crabs. They're big too, that means they're probably ready to hatch. The question is, you know, what do we make of this? You could argue that the types of regulations and management measures that we impose really aren't that important because these species are going to fluctuate anyhow. But I don't see it that way at all. I see that we have a responsibility to conserve these species, recognizing that they fluctuate naturally. And so we just have to try to conserve them against this background of change.